This is going to be a very short presentation on initiation. And even though the presentation will be quick and hopefully simple to understand, the concept of initiation is probably the most important one when it comes to refereeing roller derby. And so if you're new, it's something you need to understand. And if you're a vet, it's something you always need to work on. Initiation can change a soon-to-be illegal block into a legal one in the blink of an eye. And it is something that requires a practiced eye and often teamwork to get correct. Before we begin, however, I'd like to give you some fair warning. This presentation is not the official word from the WFTDA or MRDA. I am a level 4 referee with the WFTDA, but I am not working for them, and this has no official approval from them. I'm just a guy who wants to help out. And like anything that doesn't come with a WFTDA or MRDA seal of approval, take with an appropriate level of salt. In an effort to keep this presentation as correct as possible, I'm including the date that this presentation was recorded. In the event that I need to update the presentation due to something that was clarified or just out and out wrong, this date will change and there will be an update in the change log that's listed with the presentation on refed.com. This presentation was updated on January 9, 2017 for the 2017 WFTDA rules release. The bulk of this presentation was recorded on June 19, 2014. So what is initiation? If you look up the definition, and thank you Google, it's, quote, the action of beginning something, unquote. So any kind of action at its very basic level involves something to initiate it. The jam starts and Skater A starts forward. She has initiated the skating motion. Taken one step further, Skater B sidesteps and blocks Skater A. Skater B has initiated that block. In terms of roller derby, the initiator is the last person in any engagement to have actively changed one's direction or speed on the track, usually involving a block to an opposing skater or an assist to a teammate. That may sound confusing if you haven't done this before, but hopefully by the time we finish, you'll have a good handle on what constitutes initiation and can start work on identifying it. Here's the most basic example I can think about. Imagine two skaters on different teams skating around the track next to each other, always in the center and at a constant speed. Nobody is in their way at any point on the track and other than the skating to maintain their speed, they're both totally passive. Now let's have one of those skaters change her direction to block skater A. Skater B has made those changes in her direction and velocity. Whether or not Skater B actually succeeds in connecting that block, she has, using that definition we talked about earlier, made an action to begin something. She acted to begin a block. Now here's where it gets complicated. Nobody skates passively in roller derby. There are changes in direction and velocity by all the skaters all of the time. So if we take that last example and just make it a smidge more complicated, still nowhere near as complicated as it can get in a game, but let's have Skater A speed up to counter the move by her opponent and then ends up placing her back in Skater B's way. Now Skater A is the initiator, even though Skater B was the first one to make a blocking action. Skater A is the latest person to make a blocking action in that engagement. Our job is to determine who was the last person to instigate a change before the block occurred. Because, and you can look this up in the glossary, quote, the initiator of a block is always responsible for the legality of the contact, unquote. So this is something that's very simple in theory but hard to see in practice. I'm going to give you two examples of where the initiator shifted from one skater to another. These examples were all things that I've seen in the last year at one location or another and were called incorrectly by very experienced and really good officials. Before I begin, I need to stress that mistakes happen and we all make them. 
I made a mistake refing soccer that ended up with my getting an escort to my car to protect me from, well, everyone. So until the police are called in, and in my case they were, you don't need to sweat your mistakes. That said, when I was thinking of including video clips to include in this presentation, I decided against it because I don't want to subject people or crews to ridicule. Because even if the referee is blurred out, people can tell who they might be. So I'm using diagrams instead. Again, mistakes don't make you a bad referee. Failing to try to improve yourself from your mistakes makes you a bad referee. In this diagram, the jammer blows through all of her opponents and comes across the last defending blocker at speed. The blocker makes an adjustment, and the end result is that the jammer hits the blocker solidly in the back, sending her down. Normally, you might think of a back block penalty, which is what happened to that jammer. But remember that just because someone collides with an illegal target zone, it doesn't necessarily mean she blocked it. That last blocker starts in the middle of the track, right between the hash marks, but the point of contact is near the outside track boundary. What makes this call tricky is that the yellow jammer tries to avoid the block by going to the outside, but still ends up crashing into the blocker's back, looking like she did it. It is important to recognize in these situations how the rules define a block. Rule 2.4 says that blocking is, quote, any physical contact made to an opponent and to any movement or placement of one's body to impede said opponent's speed or movement during a jam, whether or not contact is made, unquote. Avoiding a block, therefore, is not a block, nor is it a counter block. Counter blocking is, quote, any movement towards an oncoming block by the receiving skater, unquote. The jammer is moving away from the block, but is unsuccessful at it. The initiation of the block came from the blocker, who actively tried to intersect the jammer, not from the jammer who tried to avoid the contact. The second diagram involves the jammer re-entering the track from the outside and trying to exploit a hole on the inside. By her angle, there will be contact between the jammer and the most inside person of the three wall. But if you look carefully, you'll see that the contact will be in a legal target zone, or at least imagine there will be from the dots. The contact would be on the back of the side, not on the back. I frequently hear shorthand of where the actual back begins versus where the back of the side is as between the bra straps. Once the blockers see the jammer going for the hole, the blocker furthest inside shifts further inside, and it only has to be a few inches or less, and boom, there's a spectacular collision by the jammer onto the back of the blocker, and the jammer is called for a penalty. Except it shouldn't be. Even though there is a square hit to an illegal target zone, the blocker led with that zone which means that her back is no longer a target, but actually what she is blocking with. That block just failed in knocking over or stopping the other jammer. It did, however, succeed in getting an incorrect call being made against the jammer. And by the way, this call is missed all the time, so please be aware. Something I mentioned early on is that calling initiation correctly can sometimes require teamwork. If you're not in the proper position, you won't be able to see who initiated the block. But sometimes, even if you are in the proper position, you won't be able to see. Some of this applies to just about everything, such as a referee on the inside not being able to see what happens on the outside over the middle of a tight pack. In those cases, you, you defer to your outside pack ref, who has a superior vantage point. But something else that I don't see talked about as much involves jammer referees. A well-known bench coach used to say, and maybe still does, that jammer refs only have one person to watch. And while that's not strictly true, jam refs do have a much tighter focus of vision than pack refs. 
And in this scenario, the jammer referee, especially if she's at high speed, may not be able to see the initiation of a blocker in the wall before the jammer hits that wall. It comes down to inside Packrest being able to communicate that the jammer changed her state from being the initiator to the initiated upon. There's no standard that I'm aware of, but if you want a suggestion, try no penalty, blocker initiated, and that should be adequate enough to get the point across. In conclusion, knowing what initiation is and getting it right are two different things. It takes experience in order to be able to get the correct judgment, and even then, because we're human beings, we'll still fail from time to time. My best suggestions on how to improve your judgment and in initiation are twofold. First, take comments from your peers seriously. If you're working with a good ref and they think you are incorrect, keep it in mind. You don't have to assume they're always correct, but if you get a chance to go over it in your head, do so. The second thing I can suggest is having your games recorded. Watching yourself can be a very humbling experience, but it can also teach you a whole lot. I'd like to thank the Vienna Roller Derby for their permission to use their Ultimate Roller Derby Ubiquitous Magnet Board for this presentation. It can be found at viennarollerderby.org slash urdumb. I'd also like to thank the following photographers who gave me permission to use their photos. Preflash Gordon, Doff Lensgren, Masonite Byrne, and Corfan. If you found this presentation helpful, or think it or other presentations at refed.com might be helpful to others, please share this site. But please do not modify it or send it out without appropriate credit for its production. This presentation is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License.